Hello and welcome back friends. I'm Dr Sally and you're watching LaTeX for Scientists. In today's episode, Maths for Beginners. As promised, we're using Overleaf and I'm starting off in the same document that we created last time. We're going to keep today's code neatly contained in its own file, so we'll have a little bit of setup first. We'll make a new file by clicking up here on the left sidebar and we'll call it maths.tech. Then we need to tell the compiler where to look for this file. So inside main.tech, we're going to create a new section heading with backslash section squigglies maths. And then we'll input the maths.txt file using backslash input maths.tech inside the squigglies. Now, since we're not interested in these sections from last time, we're going to comment them out using a percent symbol at the start of each line. In this way, we don't junk up our preview window. Then we'll recompile just to make sure we haven't made any typos in our file names. And luckily we haven't. I'm constantly making typos, so it's always a nice surprise not to get any errors. On a side note, if you want the compiler to refresh for you automatically, just click on the little triangle button here next to recompile and set auto compile to on. I'm very easily distracted, so I keep mine off. The next thing we want to do is go to the preamble and call the maths package math tools by typing backslash use package and then inside the squigglies math tools. You might see the AMS math package in older templates. Both of these packages do the same thing, which is to give you more advanced math displays and symbols than you would get in the basic vanilla LaTeX. AMS math still works just fine. Math tools is just newer and has more features. It's up to you which one you use, but if you do any maths at all, you need to make sure that you call one of them. So that's our setup done, and now we can move on to the actual maths. There's two fundamental ways of showing maths in your document. You have the inline maths environment, which lets you type maths inside a paragraph, and you have the equation environment for displaying your equation separately. The equation environment is your default if you want to show off an equation. It makes it really easy for the reader to pick it out from the text. And with all our writing, we want to make life as easy as possible for our reader. This environment automatically puts the equation in the center of the page and aligns the equation number to the right hand side. The best part is you don't have to number your equations yourself because LaTeX does it for you. To use it, you type backslash begin squigglies equation. And then because we had a begin equation, we need an end equation as well. Overleaf has put it in for us, so that's easy. Your equation then goes between the begin and end equation brackets, if you like. So let's start with something super basic, the equation for a straight line, which is y equals mx plus c. And let's recompile that and see our first piece of math on the screen. You can see that even though I didn't type any spaces, the compiler has put some spacing between the letters so that they don't look completely squashed. It ignores any spaces you type inside the math environment, so you can put whatever spaces between the characters you want. It just makes it a little bit more readable for you. In most LaTeX environments, you can suppress numbering if you really want to using the star symbol. The equation would still display in the middle of the page, but won't be numbered. Anyway, we're going to fully cover referencing in a future video, but for now we can give this equation a cheeky label, and then we can refer to it in the text by name instead of having to care about the equation number, because who wants to do that? So to give it a label, we go inside the equation environment and type backslash label, and then set of squigglies. And then we put the name we want to call it inside the squigglies. So let's say eq colon gradient. Now when we're typing in our manuscript, so as one can see in equation, blah, blah, blah. And then where we'd normally put the equation number, instead we type backslash ref to tell the compiler we want to refer to something. And then we give it the name of the thing that we want to refer to. So in this case, the label that we gave it before, eq colon gradient. When we recompile, we see that inside our paragraph, the compiler's figured out that we're talking about this equation and it's inserted the correct equation number here for us. And because in the last episode we used hyperref to add coloured clickable links, it's also in blue to make it more obvious, and if we clicked on it in the PDF, it would take us to where that equation is inside the text, which is very handy for the reader. 
So then we have the inline maths environment, and we use this when we're writing in a paragraph and we don't want the flow of the text to get interrupted by displayed maths. So instead of using the begin and end equation brackets, we use dollar symbols as our brackets instead. Let's say we're doing some data analysis and we're talking about uh, something something sigma clipping. The only thing is, we don't want sigma to be spelled out like this. We need to show the Greek letter instead. So what we do is we put dollar signs either side of the sigma here, and then a backslash in front of it as well, and that turns it into a command, and that's it. As long as you know how the letter is spelled in English, typing Greek symbols in LaTeX is a piece of cake. If you need the uppercase letter, just spell it with the first letter capitalised. If the capital letter is the same in English and in Greek, like A and B is the same for alpha and beta and so on, then you can just use the English letter instead. We can also write the equation from earlier as well. So dollar $y equals mx plus c dollar. If we recompile, we can see they're all in the same line. You've probably noticed that the font looks different when it's in math mode, and this actually makes it quite useful for writing variable names so that you can distinguish them from regular text. One of the main uses for inline maths is to write subscripts and superscripts in your text. So backslash begin equation, and then we can do a simple function like, uh, let's say the integral, so backslash int of x dx. Then let's say that we want our limits to be from zero to one. So we click just to the right of the backslash int, and then for subscript zero, we do underscore zero. And for superscript one, we do circumflex one. So then we recompile. And we can see that the compiler's figured out what we wanted and it's put both the limits right next to the integral, even though we typed the subscript zero first. This works just the same in the inline environment as well. So if you wanted to use a subscript in the name of your variable, like h0 for example, we would do dollar $h underscore zero dollar. If you wanted the h to be in a regular font, you can put it in front of the dollars like this, and you would still get the zero as a subscript. What happens if we want, say, x to the power of minus one? Let's see what this does. And, oh no, it's ignored the one and only superscripted the minus. So to fix that, we put the minus one into squiggly brackets like this, and that gently persuades LaTeX to treat the contents as one object. And so everything inside the squigglies, no matter how long, will get superscripted. It can get a bit irritating to keep typing out maths that you need to use often. For instance, if you want to get a degree symbol, you first have to type dollar backslash circ dollar to get a circle symbol, and then you superscript it with the circumflex, and then you also have to contain it all in squiggly brackets. And after about the 10th time, you'll be very bored of typing all of that out. So my ultimate time-saving tip for maths that you have to type out a lot is to pre-save it as a definition and give it a much shorter command that you can type instead, so that we can be very lazy and only ever have to type it once, which is LaTeX in a nutshell. So inside the preamble, in main.tech, underneath where we've called all the packages, we're going to type in backslash new command with two sets of squigglies after it, like this. Inside the first set of squigglies, we're going to think of a name for our command. So basically the thing that we want to type instead of the mess that we don't. So if we're making a command that's going to print a degree symbol, then let's call this command backslash dg. Even I can remember that when I'm typing. So backslash new command and then backslash dg in the first squiggly brackets. Now in the second set of squigglies, we put the horrible mess that we want the compiler to print any time that it sees this backslash dg command. And now we can test that out down here. And we see that it works. But we can also see that there's no gap between the symbol and the text that comes after it. This is actually by design so that if your symbol comes at the end of a sentence, that you don't end up with a big stray gap. But that does bring us to bonus tip number two, 
spacing. If you're using a definition and you want to add a regular space right after it, you can just put another backslash on the end of the definition. So backslash dg backslash in our example. If you need to add any spaces to make your mass look nicer, you have some commands that will help you with that. To get a space the width of one character, you can use backslash quad, although that's usually a little bit too wide in the middle of an equation. The one I use most often is backslash comma, which is a small space, and it just helps to improve the readability by not having things quite so bunched in together. The basic way to show fractions is to use backslash frac, and then two sets of squiggly brackets. In the first set of squigglies, we put the numerator, or the stuff on the top, and in the second set we put the denominator, or the stuff on the bottom. The compiler formats the output according to the context the fraction appears in, so if you use it inside an equation environment, it will use display style, and the equation gets nicely stretched out, and if you use it in an inline environment, it will use text style, so that the whole fraction fits onto the height of one line. This might not produce the output that you want though. So for example, if you have to put fractions inside of other fractions, the components can end up becoming quite small. If you want to control precisely which formatting gets used no matter what environment you're in, you can either use backslash defrac to force display style or backslash tfrac to force text style. It doesn't hurt to kind of play around a bit and find out what looks best to you, AKA the fuck around and find out method. The other option that you have is to use slanted fractions. For example, if we wanted to type half, we could do one over two, and then superscript the one, subscript the two. And if you have to show something to the power of a fraction, this can be a really neat way to improve the readability. If you need to put brackets around your fractions, the default can end up looking a little bit derpy. To improve the way it looks, you can put backslash left in front of the left hand bracket, and backslash right in front of the right hand bracket. This will mark the brackets out for special attention and the compiler will then scale those brackets to whatever content is inside them. Sometimes you might have nested brackets though, and for that you can use backslash big to make the outer brackets larger than the inner ones. The main way to show matrices is to use begin matrix and end matrix inside your math environment to create a space for setting up your matrix or array. You then write out the contents row by row. Each column is separated by an ampersand symbol, and then at the end of each row you put a double backslash to mark where the next row starts. So if we wanted a plain 2x2 two two array it would look like this. So we'll put this inside dollars, and we'll do backslash begin squigglies matrix. And then on the first row, we'll do one ampersand two and double backslash to mark the end of the first row. And then three ampersand four, and that's it. If you want to have brackets around it, which is quite usual in some fields, then instead of using matrix inside the squigglies, you could use P matrix to put round brackets around it or B matrix for square ones. The next bonus tip is aligning stuff. By default, the matrix environment aligns every column centrally, but this can make a little bit of a mess if you've got numbers of different lengths or if you've got negative numbers. So what we can do if we want it to still look nice is instead of using matrix, we could use matrix star. And then what we can do is we can specify what alignment we want with an optional argument in square brackets after that, so let's say we want it to be right aligned, we could put an R inside these square brackets, and then that will align each of the columns to the right, which means the numbers will be stacked on top of each other. Like with the regular matrix command, if you want round brackets, you can use P matrix star, and for square brackets, you can use B matrix star. If you're doing a derivation of some kind and you want to align your equations by the equal sign, you can use the align environment, which you can think of as kind of like a two column table. The parts on the left of the equal sign are essentially in the first column and the stuff on the right, including the equal sign, go into the right hand column. The ampersand, as before, marks the start of a new column. And so it goes in front of the equal sign and then each row is ended with a double backslash. Let's try this with a slightly more horrible looking equation. 
So we'll do backslash begin, squigglies align, and then we'll do E equals, and then we'll put an ampersand in front of the equals. And then we want to make basically a giant fraction. So we'll do backslash frac, two sets of squigglies. And then on the top line, so in the first squiggly brackets, we put MC circumflex two for MC squared. And then in the second set of squigglies, a square root of all of the rest of the stuff. So we'll do backslash SQRT to make a square root and then squiggly brackets. Anything that we put inside these brackets is going to be part of that square root. So then we want one minus another fraction. <laughs> so backslash frac V squared in the top one and C squared in the bottom one. And then we end that line with a double backslash. And then on the next line, which we want to align with the top one, we'll put ampersand equals and then backslash gamma mc squared. You'll notice that both lines have been given a number. We don't always want that, so you can suppress the numbering completely by changing a line to a line star, like this, or you can suppress it just on specific lines by putting backslash no number before the double backslash. In a lot of equations, you'll come across characters that need to be shown differently than the default italics. To make a letter upright, you can put it inside the backslash math rm command. And this is quite common when you're typing units. It can get a bit funny about Greek characters, though. So if you need any upright Greek characters, like, for example, if you're typing micrometers, then you can call the package up Greek in your preamble. Another alternative is the SI unit X package. We're going to cover this in the video on advanced maths, but I'll link it below anyway, and then you can check it out for yourself if you want to. You might also need to make characters in bold, which is common for some fields when you're presenting vectors. To do that, you can surround your text with backslash text BF. So now we've got all the basic tools we need. Making our equations look gorgeous in LaTeX is mostly about putting all these tools to use and paying attention to all the little details. Since everybody hates quantum mechanics, let's tackle the Schrodinger equation together. First of all, we've got the elements on the left. We know that we're going to have a fraction, so we can put in the backslash frac already. And then in front of that, we know that we're going to have i backslash h bar to get the h with the bar through it. And then on the other side of the fraction, we're going to have psi, but it's a capital psi, so we want backslash capital P. SI, and then inside the brackets we've got R, T. But we notice that the R is actually in boldface, so we want to wrap that in backslash math BF. And then inside the fraction we've got a partial derivative. So to get a partial derivative we want to use backslash partial on top and bottom. And it's in respect to t, so on the bottom we have partial t. So that's left-hand side done, that's quite straightforward. So let's have a look at the right-hand side. We've got these square brackets, and then we have psi rt again. So actually we can just copy and paste from the left-hand side the psi rt, and we'll paste that here on the other side of these square brackets. So that's that part done. So now inside the square brackets, we've got another fraction. So we'll put backslash frac then two sets of squigglies. And it's actually a negative fraction. So we'll put a minus in front of that. And on the top level of the fraction, we want h bar again, backslash h bar. And we want that squared. So circumflex two. And then on the bottom of the fraction, we want two m. So that's the fraction done. Now next we've got this upside down triangle, which is a nabla, so we can do backslash nabla, and that's also squared, and that's that dealt with. And then we want plus capital V, and then brackets, and then we've got R, which again is in bold. So you notice that the brackets have not been sized, so what we're going to do is put a left 
in front of this left hand bracket, so backslash left. And then we'll put backslash right in front of the right hand bracket. And then just to improve the spacing a teeny tiny bit, after the IH on the left hand side, we're going to put backslash comma. And then we're also going to put a backslash comma after the minus sign, just to make sure that it's clearly separated from the fraction line. And then if we recompile that, and there we go. A horrible equation made to look perfectly lovely in LaTeX with no time at all. So I hope you've enjoyed this introduction to maths in LaTeX. If you did, please feel free to share it with your friends. And if there's anything that's given you problems or that you're confused about or that you think I covered too quickly, then feel free to drop a comment down below. I'm always happy to try and help. You can find the final code with comments on my website. All that's left for me to say is thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.